All right, thanks, Wendy, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of 2024. I'm Tony Bergantino, Director of the Wyoming State Climate Office and the Water Resources Data System, and uh, the uh, the briefing today is uh, being put on by my office as well as the University of Wyoming Extension, uh, USDA Northern Plains uh, Climate Hub, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey is with us, and then we have the National Weather Services off Service offices in uh, both Cheyenne and Riverton presenting today. And we'll look at uh, current drought, climate conditions, surface water conditions, and then go into some forecasts and outlooks, followed by a, a short overview on uh, conditions as they were in, in calendar year 2023. So starting out in current conditions as usual, this is the drought map that was released this morning, valid through uh, this week, uh, Tuesday the 16th. Uh, prior to this recent spat of snow and cold, uh, conditions throughout December into early January have been mostly warm and dry, and as such, we uh, do see quite a bit of drought expansion across the state. Uh, the areas in red, uh, those have deteriorated since our, our November webinar, recall that we did not do the one in December. And while we do have that little arc down in south central Wyoming outlined there in green, uh, that did improve a little bit since the last time we've been, but uh, by and large, it's been degradations across the state. Uh, just for comparison purposes, again, here's where we were a year ago compared to today. The moderate drought that we have in the, the south now is uh, roughly in the same area it was a year ago, though significantly less area is covered now. Uh, we do have that small patch of severe drought, that uh, darkish orange color there, just uh, west of where the larger chunks were last year. Uh, otherwise, the south, uh, central areas of Wyoming, are they're doing better than they were a year ago. Uh, the north, uh, from about the eastern border of Sheridan County westward, conditions are same or uh, worse than they were last year. And we do have that moderate drought uh, in western Park County there that was, uh, was absent a year ago, but we, we do have that now. Uh, timelines, here's the updated timeline showing uh, just how much of the states in each of those drought categories. Uh, fortunately, it's uh, limited to two drought categories and the abnormally dry right now. Uh, but this goes from the start of 2000 through this Thursday. You can see the, uh, or Tuesday, you can see the area of coverage increasing on the far right of the graph there after our, our little five week period of a, where we had a blank map, but that's, that's starting to fill in again, unfortunately. Uh, zoom in here. This is a zoom in from uh, 2020, January 2020 to present. Uh, and this shows the rise in the last three to four months uh, a lot more plainly than the, the, the larger time frame does. Uh, still just over half of the state is free of any D category, uh, but the area of moderate drought is about doubled since the last webinar and stands uh, just under four and a half percent. Looking at uh, precip over the last two weeks, uh, below median in the northwest and Bighorns, uh, along with that area up there in the uh, the far northeast corner there. Uh, the Bighorn Basin has been above median, along with most of the, the south and uh, parts of the southern uh, northeast area. There we go. 90-day precipitation at three months. Uh, not as good a situation. Uh, southwest, along with the all the wind and uh, southern bighorn basins have been about medium, but below to well below for the for the rest of the state. And looking at uh, comparison of two different calendars here, uh, two maps show the water year to date precipitation that is from the first of October uh, through current on the left, and on the right is since the first of January or the calendar year, and that water year one is similar to the last three months. Uh, map that we saw since it covers only a slightly longer time frame. Uh, the map since the start of 2024 shows the dryness along the northern part of the state extending down uh, into the Bighorns, but leaving the Bighorn Basin itself at uh, not doing too bad at more than 150% of average right now. Uh, look at the standardized precipitation index or that SPI. Uh, the upper two maps for the 30 and uh, 60 days uh, continue to accentuate that dry conditions in some of the northern reaches, especially the the uh, the northwest and the Bighorns spilling over into the powder, tongue basins, and and parts there in the northeast. 
Uh, at the bottom right, we have the the depiction for the last year, and the picture there is much better with only two real small minor areas of concern down there that are still uh, at that time period coming out of uh, the, the dryness there in the far south central part of the state, and then that one up there in the uh, the very far northwest. Otherwise, we still see the uh, the influence of that wet June and August, along with uh, September and October, at least in the north. Uh, 14-day average minimum temperature. Uh, safe to say it has been cold. Uh, south, and especially the southwest, they've been uh, the warmest, both in terms of um, the absolute temperature, the thermometer temperature uh, on the upper right, and then also... Uh, They've seen the least departure from normal on the lower left, although it still was a departure to the uh, to the cold side. Some of our Mesosnet stations saw lows in the, the lower minus 30s. Uh, Co-op took minus 40, and that was about the limit of its sensors. And then some areas north of here were in the uh, in the minus 40s, uh, especially along the river bottoms. Um, and that was during the during the height of that earlier this week. Most of the state east of the divide and the higher parts were more than 10 degrees below average over the last two weeks. Uh, two week maximums. Uh, well, for those of us been around a while, second verse, same as the first. Uh, just slide the scale upward about 15 degrees for the actual temperatures and the departures from average are uh, roughly about the same amounts and in the same locations, a little bit fuzzy around the, the borders of those areas, but uh, generally same situation as we saw for the minimums. Uh, soil moisture, fairly static in the soils department over the last two weeks, and that's usual for this time of year when the ground is mostly frozen. Uh, some of our stations, we've got uh, soil temperatures at one meter that are, are below zero, so that, that frost depth is down there quite a ways. Uh, those are up in the, in the northeast area. I'm tempted to take these two images and see if I can set up a spot the differences puzzle. There's a few, but it's uh, very, very similar uh, two weeks apart. Looking at basin numbers for snowpack, um, here's to the numbers for today on the right compared to one year ago uh, on the left side of the, the screen. Uh, we're down considerably this year in all basins compared to this date last year. Uh, currently our uh, best basin in terms of percent of median is the, the upper bear at 108%, uh, while uh, excluding the South Platte, our, our lowest basin is the Powder River Basin, which is only turning in about 55% of the median. Uh, the Bear is currently the only, only basin that we have right now that is above the median. Looking at snow water equivalent in terms of the, uh, the area amounts, this is remotely sent snow water equivalent uh, across the state yesterday and one year ago. Uh, last year, we had heavy low elevation snowpack, uh, even though the higher elevations were normal to uh, even below normal, but uh, the low elevation really, really was seeing some good numbers, uh, too good actually in some places. Uh, this year, we can see the distribution of the snow and that all but a few areas to are, you know, they're below to well below median, the southeastern plains and generally, they're generally the best, uh, best showing that we're having. Uh, and I mentioned earlier the bear and powder uh, are best and worst performing bases. And these uh, two charts uh, show each of those basins, um, show how their, their snowpack has progressed through the season. You can see the powder is right about at the minimum, just starting to slightly creep above that, uh, right about there, where all the recent snows in the West have brought the, uh, the bear up to about the median, pushing through it a little bit there. Now, this is a new product that I developed and released this week. It gives a, a quick glance at each of the basins in the state and where they stand compared to the various uh, statistics, the various percentiles, median, max, min, what have you. Uh, shows current snow water equivalent or SWE in inches and as a percent of median in columns three and four. Uh, the last two columns, you can see where, uh, where each basin was on this date uh, last year, one year ago. Uh, in terms also of inches and uh, percents of median. The seven colored basins in or colored columns in between are the values uh, of the minimum for the day on the far left and the maximum value that's uh, occurred uh, on this day is on the far right. 
the middle column is the median, and then in between those are the values for the, the 10th, uh, 30th, 70th, and the 90th percentiles. And the color of the values of those statistics depends on whether it is below the current uh, snow water equivalent value or above it. Uh, so the more blue numbers, which means it's uh, below what our current value is, the better. So, for example, the in the Little Snake Basin, uh, the fifth one down there, uh, the first three values are blue, meaning uh, you know, the, the current value is above those and is somewhere between the 30th and 50th percentile or the median. Uh, the median is 10.4 inches there in red, which is, is greater than the 9.9, .9, and the 30th percentile is in 8.6. So that's in blue since that's less than the 9.9, .9, which is the current value. And this table is updated daily and it's found at the URL that I hope that's not being covered up there on the bottom part of the screen, but uh, it will show up in the, the PDF of the slides when we put it out there. So with that, I will now turn it over to Aaron Fiaschetti with the US Geological Survey to tell us about stream flow conditions. <clears throat> Go ahead, Aaron. Thanks, Tony. Uh, uh... Well, here we are in January and winter finally showed up. Right now, it's kind of a tough time for USGS gauges. Uh, as you can see here is our image from the National Water Information Dashboard that the majority of the dots on the map are gray. That means sites are in ice. When ice forms on a river, it disrupts our stage discharge relationship and we're not able to provide reliable real-time data. There are a few sites out there that are uh, reporting data, and it's kind of a mixed bag that uh, light blue is above normal. And then uh, we have a couple low sites. One is over on the in the Snake River area, and then another one in the park. But I guess take everything I say with a grain of salt, as I'll kind of explain more, as it's, it's a tough time to gauge. So the going over to the next uh, next slide, please. So right here is a, a duration hydrograph for Wyoming. The axis there is a seven day average runoff in millimeters. So it's kind of a water per land area. It's not a typical hydrograph that we would present, but, uh, but it kind of gives you an idea of where we are for the water year. And here we are in January, it's showing that it's somewhere between the above normal to much above normal. So above the 75th percentile. But that's for the reporting site. So we have 19 of their 126 sites are reporting right now. And even though it looks really good, it's just a time of limited water supply. So having a, a very high percentile doesn't necessarily result in a, a large amount of water to fill reservoirs or meet other needs right now. So um, it looks good, but it's, uh, yeah, that these sites are, are still could be affected by ice. So just bouncing over to the South Fork of the Little Wind right now. Uh, and the, so right now things have been kind of hanging on in the water year here. They've been kind of hanging in the green. You see the black line is uh, 2024, 2023, 2024 values. That green is uh, what the USGS considers normal. So the 25th to 75th percentile. So, but it, it looks like it's hanging above the median. It's looked pretty good. Um, that site looks like it kind of continues to decline into February, uh, this period of base flow, and then starts to receive some moisture as we start to melt out some snowpack. But so far, things are looking pretty good on the, the little wind. And then moving over to the powder. Here's the middle fork of the Powder River near Barnum. Uh, seems like in the fall, things were looking well above average into that blue. Um, I'm not quite sure the cause of that, probably some fall precipitation or an abundance of moisture prior to that. Um, but I'd say that little that little dive here recently probably kind of coincides with uh, ice formation and maybe restricting flow there a little bit. But it, it's overall the flows on the little powder or the powder near middle fork of the powder excuse me near barnum look pretty good and they'll they'll probably continue to be there until we start to melt out 
and then moving down south to the North Brush Creek near Saratoga. Uh, seems like flows weren't quite as high down here, looking here at the beginning of the water year in October 1st, uh, hanging a little bit closer to the 25th percentile, that black line, and it's kind of sustained there. I've seen some bumps from fall. Precipitation is rain, but as we moved into the snow season and cold weather season, it's been pretty static and probably expected to stay there. So moving to the next slide. Here's just a kind of a comparison for uh, reservoirs throughout the state. In general, there wasn't a, much of a change in reservoir storage, probably some small gains in most reservoirs that are trying to build a little storage with winter flows. There were some larger decreases in Fontenelle and Bighorn. I'm sure that's uh, operational to move water downstream. And Reservoirs are kind of hanging in between 50 and 90% full, give or take, for most of them in the state. So that's all I have. Thank you, Tony. Right. Thanks, Aaron. Now we'll jump over to the weather forecast and outlooks. And we have Lance Vanden Bogart with the National Weather Service up in Riverton. Lance. All right. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. So looking at our overall year long calendar here for weather hazards and what kind of things we typically deal with uh, firmly in the middle of winter storm, as uh, those out west can testify to over the last couple of days. Um, high winds can definitely occur as well. Um, we have the strong jet stream over us. So firmly in that time of the year. Um, a little bit early for ice jams. Typically, it certainly can happen on uh, when we have warm years in particular and at certain antecedent conditions. We're not seeing a lot of that in Wyoming currently. Um, so that, that's good. But as we move into February and then later into March, that becomes more of the peak time for ice jams. And uh, all of our summer, we're, we're not in summer, so we can avoid, uh, avoid those ones. But <laughs> stepping forward here, we'll look at precipitation over the next seven days and what that forecast looks like. We have multiple rounds of light to moderate snow still forecast for the west. Um, the pattern will become uh, less stagnant and more uh, occasional weak weather systems moving through over the next week. Uh, the Those western mountains and then a little bit in the south there, you can see that the higher uh, peaks could see maybe an inch or so of SWE. Uh, but for the rest of the state, quite dry. Um, there's a lot of that light green, but that light green there is less than one tenth of an inch of precipitation or, or you know melted down snow equivalent. So that's really not a lot. It's, it's a dry week overall for the forecast. If we step forward and look at uh, the two week outlook, so the week after this next one, that's January 25th through the 31st, you can see pretty high confidence that we're actually gonna return to above normal for uh, a lot of the, all the state. Um, we have been below normal, so this will be a welcome, uh, welcome change for many. But then if you look at precipitation, there's really not a strong signal. So climatology is going to be your best forecast, you know, looking to the average high and low for this date. Um, I guess I should say the average amount of precipitation for the week, that's going to be what, uh, what you want to look at there for precipitation. Stepping further, further forward, looking into the month of February, there is a uh, lean towards above normal, especially for the northern half of the state for temperatures. So keeping that trend going, um, but then precipitation, same uh, same story here where your February precip, um, if you're wondering what that's gonna be, look to your 30-year uh, averages to get a sense for what that is. There's not really a lean one way or another, uh, taking into account El Nino and all those larger scale global uh, uh, global trends not really seeing a lot. Equal chances is the story. And then if we go forward uh, to spring outlook, so stepping just a little bit further, March, April, May timeframe, you can see that uh, confidence decreases further um, and equal chances becomes more widespread. So that's anywhere that you see the white colors on here, uh, which is for much of Wyoming, both for temperature and precip. Climatology, again, is your best forecast. For temperature there, maybe you see a slight lean for Yellowstone in the far north uh, toward above normal, but that signal is not very strong. Um, it's only slightly better than a third as far as uh, the, the probability goes there, if you look on the bottom uh, key. And I think that wraps up all I have to say and moving on to the next presenter.
All right, and I'll let Tony Anderson from the Cheyenne Weather Service Office take this one. All right, uh, they, good or Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, good to see everyone back. Uh, they asked me to take just a quick look at uh, what our water supply outlook is for 2024. And it's, we're very early in the season, so it's very difficult to give a, a solid picture of what we can expect. However, we've, we've done our initial water supply forecasts for, for the state, for the country. And these are, they're presented here color-coded by their percent of normal. And as you can see, uh, especially down in the upper green, the things are looking pretty orange and yellow, meaning they're below normal. Uh, we have really the only places that we're seeing significantly above normal are on the Bighorn River uh, from River 10 North. And that's, that coincides with a lot of where we're seeing the higher snowpacks. Otherwise, uh, take everything here with a grain of salt uh, because it is very early in the season. We did start the season with a snow deficit, however, and that's reflected in these first forecasts. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is a little older than the slide uh, Tony showed you earlier, but it's a snow water equivalent map by basin. And you can see statewide, we're below normal. Uh, we've picked up in the southern tier, we've picked up some snow in the last couple of days even. And, but the take home message here is that we are starting the season in a deficit and that is going to affect our water supply outlook. Uh, this deficit is more or less snow statewide. And the good news is February through April are where we pick up our peak snow. So we have the bulk of our snow to yet to come but we are starting in a little hole. The limited snow, if that continues through the spring, uh, would mean limited runoff potential. So that means lower water supplies and a lower, norm, lower than normal probability of flooding uh, throughout the state. The chance of flooding will of course be affected by spring rains that you know, are not directly related to the snow snowpack, but that gets into some really gray areas and outlooks because we just can't see that far. So right now, limited, uh, reduced probability of flooding across the state. And we're probably, unless we get a big, a big winter, we're probably looking at a near to below average water supply season. And I think that covers that part of the outlook. All right, thanks, Tony. And uh, now we'll uh, we'll take a, a brief look back at 2023 climatologically and uh, we'll see what we got here, starting with uh, temperature. So here we have uh, some temperature stats for uh, statewide average mean temperature for the year, uh, the year 2023, that is. Uh, 2023 came in at uh, average across the state, 42.2 degrees Fahrenheit for the year, which is just a tenth of a degree under the 30-year average, uh, the 30-year uh, normal from 1991 to 2020. It was 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit above the 20th century average, uh, which is 40.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And it was well below the year 2012, which had the, that was the, the highest mean temperature for the state since uh, 1895. Uh, this year was a, a full four degrees Fahrenheit below the 2012 average statewide temperature. The 42.2 uh, average annual mean is ranked as the 31st warmest of the last uh, 129 years going from uh, 1895 through current. Looking across the state uh, in terms of a departure from normal on temperatures, uh, this is the annual average temperature uh, last year. Uh, subtracting the 1991 to tw uh, 2020 normal. So uh, if it's uh, green, it means we were colder uh, this year than the normal. And if it's in those warmer colors, well, we were warmer than the, the normal. And so we were about one to two degrees above normal in parts of the Northeast, while uh, much of the Southwest and some of the central areas were uh, up to three degrees below normal, uh, a little bit more. Uh, the dark gray areas around the rest of the state are areas that were within, oh, plus or minus uh, one degree Fahrenheit of, of normal. 
going over to precipitation and uh, 2023 was a little bit on the wet side uh, the average statewide precipitation total came to uh, 18.92 inches and that's uh, 1.58 inches below the all-time highest year which was 1927 uh, when the average was uh, average total was uh, 20 and a half inches uh, we're above both the 30-year average the 1991 to 2020 period and also above the 20th century average uh, and those came in at uh, 16.02 inches and uh, 15.94 inches uh, respectively and we were almost eight inches above the all-time low year which was again that 2012 which uh, saw only 10.96 inches across the state all in all uh 2023 ranked as the 11th wettest year of the last 129 and looking at that in map format as a as a percent of normal to see where where the distribution is across the state uh northwest was right about uh, right above average where the south central parts were uh average to as low as 70 percent of normal uh for the year uh, the rest of the state came in above to <laughs> well above normal in some spots, especially where you see those uh, those purple colors, which uh, signify amounts that are over 150 percent of normal. Uh, snowpack, all but two of the basins, the South Platte in Wyoming and the Tongue Basin, had uh, peak snow water equivalent values that were above their median. Uh, Ten of the basins, uh, they reached their the, the date when they had that peak snow water equivalent early. Uh, the earliest peak uh, compared to median peak date was reached in the Tongue, and that came in uh, 23 days early. The latest peak date compared to the to its median was in the Snake, and that reached its peak uh, 13 days after its normal uh, median peak date. Uh, 15 of the 19 basins around the state uh, had their peak between the 7th and 9th of April, and uh, the remaining four uh, reached their respective uh, peaks between the 24th and 28th of April. The lowest percentage of peak was experienced in the South Platte Basin at 83%, and uh, the Little Snake Basin had its uh, the highest peak compared to its median, uh, and it reached uh, between 157 and or 155 and 157%. Uh, the upper bear was a, a very close second and peaked at 156% uh, of its median value. And then the others sort of uh, dropped off from there. Looking at reservoir storage for 2023, reservoirs on the 1st of June were in fairly good shape and had filled to uh, over 76% of system capacity from the spring runoff. Uh, storage in the reservoir amounted to just over uh, 9.1 million acre feet. By the end of the year, uh, reservoir releases lowered storage um, somewhat, with the notable changes being in uh, Palisades, Guernsey, and Glendo. Uh, total storage went down to just under 9 million acre feet from the uh, on the 30th of September. And so the declines in storage at uh, Palisades, Glendo, Buffalo Bill uh, were offset by some increases in Pathfinder, um, Flaming Gorge, and Bighorn. But still, when you look at it in, in net terms, uh, we were down, as would be expected after the, the season. At the end of uh, water year 2023, Lake Powell and Mead, uh, the, the big downstream reservoirs, were at 36 and 34 percent capacity, respectively. And those, um, those, la la those uh, two reservoirs were about uh, 32 and 31 percent on uh, the first of June in 2023, which means there was actually about a four percent increase in both reservoirs by the end of the water year, which is anytime there's an increase, it's good. Looking at drought, well, Wyoming started the year almost uh, six and a half percent of the state was in D3 or extreme drought and another 22 uh, percent was in severe drought. Uh, but thanks to thanks to some of that precipitation in June and August, and then a little bit later there in September and October in in parts of the state, we had a we had a clear map for five weeks in late August uh, and going into about the first uh, half of September. Um, the completely clear map started on the twenty second of August, and that was the first time it had been that way since the twenty third of June of July in twenty nineteen which was 212 weeks prior to that. 
So that was a, a fairly lengthy period where we had uh, one color or another on that map. Uh, unfortunately, the clear spot was not long lived and conditions deteriorated in the south central part of the state in the latter half of September and and they began spreading. So by the end of the year, the end of the calendar year, drought conditions looked like uh, right at the map there on the right. You know, that five week period in August, uh, August and September, where that was the seventh time since 2000 that the map had been completely clear. And with the duration there, that was up the, the five weeks, that was the fourth longest stretch since 2000 that we've had a, had a clear map. So the full 2023 calendar year uh, climate summary, it's now available. I put it out this morning. It contains much more information as well as uh, monthly maps of temperature departures, uh, precipitation percentages and departures, uh, go some tables with the climate division rankings, uh, some information on hazards such as uh, hail, tornadoes, fires, floods. Uh, and that, that summary can be found at this uh, horrendous looking blue earl there on the screen. And I'll, I'll stall here for a few minutes in case uh, people want to write that down while I'm talking. But uh, if, it, uh, if I move to another slide before we get to the end of that, uh, the earl will be um, on the PDF of the slides and in the webinar when we post it. So you can, you can always check it there at, uh, at your leisure. Okay, I think that's enough time, and we'll throw her back to uh, Tony Anderson for a, a recap of water supply, and uh, go ahead, Tony. All right, thank you, Tony. Uh, I'm Tony A, in case you're wondering, he's, uh, the other Tony's Tony B. Uh, <laughs> they asked me to do a quick rundown of our water supply forecast from last year, uh, kind of continuing the recap of 2023. And just to, I want to put out some information there before I dive into the actual forecasts and what we saw. There, the National Weather Service, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and the Bureau of Reclamation all do water supply volume forecasts. The, all, all of us forecast runoff volumes. However, we do use three different models and three different methods, which is actually generally a good thing because it allows for us to compare and contrast one another's numbers. And some models being what they are, they sometimes don't work very well. And it's always good to have a second model available to you to compare your numbers to just to make sure that your numbers aren't out in the woods somewhere. The National Weather Service and the Natural Resource Conservation Service forecast native flow. Native flow is the runoff produced from precipitation and snowpack or from springs within a basin. The native flow attempts to discount reservoir operations, diversions, or trans, ba trans basin or trans mountain transfers. So what we're looking for is what the basin is going to produce. However, measuring and calculating native flow can be tricky, and sometimes we end up using observed data as a proxy for our, our uh, native flow numbers. The, if you can imagine trying to keep track of every basin or every diversion, every reservoir, and every trans mountain diversion that's affecting a watershed above a certain point, and doing all the pluses and minuses, you can see where that would become a complicated thing, especially in real, real time. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a snow water equivalent map from the NRCS uh, of the snowpack for Wyoming in April 15th of last year. And it was a pretty good snowpack year. We were anticipating flooding uh, pretty much across the state and we were pleasantly surprised that we did not get that. But it was, it was a good water year. We accumulated a lot of snow and Mother Nature cooperated with us and drain, or melted it very slowly and very gradually so that we did not see the widespread flooding across the state that we were more or less anticipating from early February on. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a summary of the snow water equivalent by basin within the state, and then the total runoff volume by basin, and they're, they're presented as a percent of the 30-year median 
value for those values. So we were near or greater than 100% of the 30 year median peak snow water equivalent across the state. You can look at those numbers, we have one that is below 100. So we were either at, and that, that would have been the tongue. And then if you jump over to the total runoff site, we have a few, we have one that, or two of them, excuse me, the Yellowstone and the Bighorn that were not 100%, but all the rest of them were, and some of them in a very large way. Uh, especially the bear and the little snake, both over 200% of normal runoff. And I will talk about the disconnect between those numbers here in just a little bit. Uh, but you can see it was, a, it was a good year for snow in Wyoming, and it was a good, good year for water production. Next slide, please. Okay, for the next five slides or so, I went through the major river basins, and, or someone else did, uh, Put together slides showing on the bottom left is the National Weather Service data or forecast, official and daily forecast of water supply total volume for the runoff season for that basin. And then on the right side of that, it shows the accumulated runoff from April 1st through, I believe it's July 30th for most sites. And on the upper right, I suppose I should have done that backward, is the Natural Resource Conservation Service graphics showing the snow accumulation by basin for the year. The dark green line in this particular slide is the heavier dark green line, is the 2023 accumulation of snowpack through the year. So it's a great graphic because it can show you when the peak arrived and it gives you a feel if you see the lighter green line down there that's much smoother that is the median value for the last 30 years. So you can see kind of what's normal, and then you can see what happened in 2023, plus you can see the date that the peak, peak snow water equivalent arrived. So in this case, we were at 111% of the snowpack as of, at, and that arrived on April 28th in the Wind River, and the observed runoff was 123% of the 30 year median. Next slide, please. Okay, looking at the Bighorn River Basin, which kind of connected to the wind, is a, again, we had a, about 102% of the 30 year median peak for snow water equivalent. And that translated into a runoff of 86% of the 30 year median runoff. And you get, interestingly, the dark blue line on the lower left that is the median forecast value for the probabilistic forecasts that were, are run daily. And it did not vary a great deal that year. There was a little blip there in February, but by and large, that was a pretty smooth forecast throughout the entire season. And you, as a forecaster, you love to see that. It, if they go up and down all over the place, it means your models are just not giving you consistent answers. And consistency is a good thing as long as it's consistently right. Next slide, please. Okay, in the North Platte River Basin, again, good year. 119% of our median SWE, and it, it arrived, a little, the peak arrived a little bit early, uh, but then we had a second bump uh, after the initial peak where we, we replaced some of that peak with a later storm. That translated into a 116% of median observed runoff. And as a, as a water supply forecaster, I love it when the SWE and the observed runoff percent of normals are very close to one another. It, it restores your confidence in the universe because it's not always the case. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. Going down into the Colorado Basin and looking at the upper green, decent year, slightly or slightly above normal at 113% of the 30-year mean. And that translated into 139% of normal or median observed runoff. And part of what you may be seeing there is, that, again, going to that lower blue line on the lower left, that, again, those four, that is our median forecast. And they climbed through the year. And so 
we, for various reasons, we were seeing more and more snow or we were expecting more and more runoff and it turned into a, a higher than probably what we would have forecast early in the season uh, runoff. That's a remarkably efficient runoff from 113% of SWE to 139% of total volume. Next slide. Okay, uh, we get this data from the Snake River at the Northwest River Forecast Center, which is different from the Colorado Basin and different from Missouri. So it looks a little different, but it presents much the same information. Really good year on the Snake, 123% of the normal median or the 30 year median. And that translated into about 100% of the 30 year median runoff. So not quite what you're hoping for when you see that big of snowpack, but it was still a pretty good runoff. Next year, next slide, please. Okay, back to our old slide slide format. And the Powder River Basin did not do as well. And the SWE peaked at 107% of the 30 year median and the observed runoff was 171%. That's a big discrepancy between those two numbers. The correlation's never perfect, but that's a big discrepancy and it probably reflects a lot of rain in the springtime that did not contribute to the snowpack. Next slide, please. In the Little Snake Basin, uh, we had a banner year in terms of, in terms of runoff. The Sweetie was also superb at 155% of the 30 year median. That is actually showing as an all time high on that graphic. At least not quite all time high though. The all time high came a little bit later in another year, but that is very close to the all time high. And for that time of year, that is a remarkable snow accumulation. The observed runoff was a 207% of the median, which is just staggering. And we're probably need to look at that and see exactly what drove that. Very possibly the wet May, June, July, and time period in, in, into August even. But uh, then we, that's the area that drove, dropped into drought later this fall. So it's something we need to take a look at, but it was a great runoff year on the Little Snake. Next slide. Okay, you saw some disconnects between our snow water equivalent and our runoff. And the first thing you have to understand is that is a, there's a very tight correlation between those two numbers, but it is not an exact correlation. It, it is not a perfect, snow water equivalent is not a perfect predictor of runoff. Lots of reasons. Part of that may be that what I was talking about earlier with we measure with one, we measure observed flow going past the point that may not actually reflect the, accurately the native flow or the flow from within the basin. For instance, uh, well, if you're looking at a runoff percentage of normal greater than the SWE percent of normal, you can look for a wet spring or summer where rain drives a lot of that runoff and maybe makes the, the snow melt more efficient, but does, is not reflected in the snowpack. And we were very wet in May through July. Uh, rain added to the runoff without adding to the SWE. And storm, those storms that brought all that rain in May to the low-lying areas, you know, to Cheyenne and Saratoga and Riverton, we're probably putting snow in the mountains. So they didn't add to the peak snowpack, but they did add to the snowpack after the peak had come. And so we were, as we were raining in the lower elevations, we were probably accumulating more snow in the uppers. It, it was slow and it doesn't really show up well in those graphics, but we probably sustained that runoff for an extra seven to 10 days, uh, just from all of that extra rain. If you have the other problem where the runoff percent of normal is less than the sweet percent of normal, uh, things to remember is that we were coming out of a drought, a fairly bad one. And we had a lot of dry soils and we had a lot of dry aquifers. And they if there is storage available before the water hits the rivers, it will soak into the ground. 
it will soak into the aquifers and it will fill those reservoirs before it starts to run off or as it starts to run off. So we may have lost a lot of water to, to the drought as we replenish the soil moisture. Uh, don't know if this happened, but at times after a large drought, you're filling empty reservoirs in the rivers. And so if you're, uh, if you have 500,000 acre feet of storage and you fill your reservoir, well, that's 500,000 acre feet that is not going past the gauge. And unless your observations take that into account, you're going to have a divergence between your SWE and your total volume. Next slide, please. Okay, I think I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. And with that, that concludes uh, concludes the webinar for today. So I'll kick it back over to Wendy Kelly to take us into wrap up. Great, thank you, Tony. And I will uh, stop the recording and want to thank all of the presenters. I